You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome in Nicole Clark, co-founder and CEO at Trellis in Los Angeles, California. Uh, Trellis is a state trial court data accessible, uh, making data accessible for the first time a comprehensive AI-powered state court research and analytics platform uh, built by litigators for litigators. Nicole, welcome in. How are you? Thanks so much. Good to be here. I'm doing well. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, Super cool. Looked at the website earlier. Um, You're doing some really uh, awesome things. I'm psyched to get into this. Um, So first off, congrats on all your success around Trellis and building this up and being able to like, you know, obviously build this, this epic new idea. Um, so like, just, just as a background, like, just tell us where you're from and like how you got interested in, in the practice of law. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I was not one of those folks that grew up knowing they were going to be a lawyer from an early age. Um, I had graduated college and was working in Western Mass at, at that point and realized that if I was going to earn enough to survive, I had to do something. I had to get additional education somewhere and I wanted it to be something that was interesting to me and engaging. And so kind of on a whim, I decided to take the LSAT and just go for it. Now, I was lucky to find out that I loved law school and I found it to be a really good fit. I mean, there's <laughs> it, can, it can be good and bad, but I, but I really enjoyed it. And so... I graduated, I started law school in uh, 2008, which was just right right at the recession, uh, banking collapse. And so there were actually no jobs when I graduated. And so the only thing that was was hiring at that point was bankruptcy and foreclosure. So I did that for a little while. Um, And then I moved firms a few times, really started to get into employment litigation, which is where I really ended up growing my practice, moved back to Los Angeles. And I just couldn't believe how we were all litigating in state trial court, and yet there wasn't a single source to search the trial court system the way you could search court of appeals data. And it just blew my mind. And I continued practicing and just seeing this giant gap in access to the state trial courts. Yep. So yeah, no, that's, that's definitely uh, finding something that needs to be done, um, finding a hole in the system. So I just want to take you back one second, because we are both UMass Amherst grads. And I think that's super cool. So big yeah. time shout out to UMass. Absolutely. Uh, what did, I'm curious, like, what was your major there? Journalism. Journalism. Okay. Uh, How are you? Did you have a good, good experience at UMass? I had a great experience at UMass. I'm a huge fan of the school, the area. Um, Yeah, I I love Western Mass. Western Mass. So you go out to LA. Tell me again, like how how did you go from Western Mass to LA? (laughs) I had actually grown up in LA. Okay. So I went to college early in Massachusetts. And so at 16, moved to the East Coast and then stayed out there for law school and practicing. And then when I had my daughter, I decided to move back to LA where I had roots and it was going to be, uh, I wouldn't have to fight the weather in addition to the rest of right. my life. Right. No, I, I totally get that. Um, so we're back in LA and let, you know, let's talk about AI. I have had a couple of uh, people on here who have some amazing legal tech, um, products. Um, but I'm really becoming fascinating on how it is going to be used in litigation. Um, mm-hmm. tell, so tell us about Trellis. We want to talk about Trellis, um, which can be used for, this is really, really interesting, judge analytics, opposing counsel research, 
yep. and, and other intelli uh, legal intelligence of state trial court records. So can we break those down one by one, like starting with judge analytics? Like, how does that work? Hundred percent. So at our core, we are a state trial court research and analytics platform. So okay. right now we're in Massachusetts, you would look up different superior courts to pull up information to pull up a docket or documents on a case you're assigned to. Um, we take away all of the limitations there. So we also go in basically county by county. We aggregate the state trial court data. We structure it. We normalize it. And then we make it so you can search not only by case number, but by judge or by lawyer or by legal issue or combinations of those things. And because we've done all this work to access this just really difficult <laughs> to wrangle data, um, we're able to power analytics on top of that. So wow. for judge analytics from a starting place, we look at all of the judges' historical data. We tell you uh, how many active cases they have, how long they take to move cases forward, broken down by practice area, uh, how long it takes if you're going to win a dispositive motion, when does that usually take place in a case before that judge, um, all the way down to granular motion by motion analytics. So how does this judge rule on and then your whole plethora of pretrial, you know, important pretrial motions. Um, so you wow. can make some good decisions about, um, you know, whether a particular motion is the right use of your time. It's also used a lot by um, partners to sort of set expectations with their client. So we know we're before this judge, let's take a look at what the data looks like. It might be that it's gonna be a really difficult situation but you know that going into it, and then you're able to sort of manage client expectations throughout. Wow, that's unbelievable. That's like, I you know, I did housing. And so that's yeah. sort of like somebody saying like at the housing session, oh, this judge is like difficult. He, you know, he won't let a tenant get evicted. You know, they yeah. won't move forward with that. But this is like hyper, like that's like, this is like a million steps further. I mean, this is like literally taking all of these, this data that you have and compiling it. And so is it something where as it keeps getting more data, Trellis gets mm -hmm. more data, it'll be like more accurate. Is that how it works? I mean, absolutely. Because there's also things that happen, right? Judges, there might be new legislation that comes out or they may tweak the way that they're handling things or the way that they've been analyzing it for years. And so the having it updated with the most current cases and motions as they're going through right now can give you sort of real time insights on the judge and uh, the way they're looking at things. That's unbelievable. So um, what about actually have you ever had a judge like comment on trellis like comment on like you know like wow you guys are like tracking my behavior or something like that like my decisions like what what is like the general opinion about it it's really interesting judges um it's a new la it's a new level of transparency for them no sure. question they are not used to having this level of transparency into their decision making i think it depends on the judge we've had some that say look I realize that the data is out there and that technology exists to be able to do this right now. So at a minimum, I want to see what the attorneys are seeing. And I want to sort of look high level at my own and, and do some self-reflection, or I'm interested oh. in the other judges in the county. Oh, yeah. um, but what we most often have actually, so we do also judge biographies. We create them in-house for every state trial court judge across the nation and are in their career history and political affiliation and practical info about their clerks and all that on one page. And we often have judges reach out to us that say, hey, I won this award, add this to my bio page or that. Really? Yeah. That's all, that's that's what they want. Just give, just that's make them happy. Want. Put all their the accolades on there and, be, <laughs> and you got a happy judge. Yep. Uh, what if they, I mean, I would hate to see a judge say, oh, well, they think that I'm going to decide this way, but I'm really going the other way. I mean, I don't think that would happen, like, but... No, it's they're interesting those, philosophical questions, though. Yeah, right? I think or, it's super cool. I mean, this is like really AI is really um, intense the way that like lawyers and litigation, like we're starting to use it. Um, so tell us about opposing counsel now. Absolutely. So opposing counsel is actually one of my favorite things to research. So we have filed documents as well, um, not just the file document by the title of the document uh, or the case number, but we actually search the body and text of the documents as well. So my favorite thing is to look up, let's say the individual attorney uh, that I am going against 
And I want to pull up not only their similar cases, but the motions they filed in similar cases previously. Right. Now, what you're used to is just like every lawyer, they're starting with something and usually something they've written in the past or at least someone in their firm. So if you can find a motion on a similar case that they've prepared previously, I mean, you have some insight into how they're likely to position the issues again. So I love thinking about how do you think about opposition or reply before, you know, the initial moving papers even get filed. So is it the actual motion? Like, can you see what they've written, like their reasoning? Or is it just like, this is the motion that they've filed? It's the actual motion. So wow. it is exactly, it's, it's what they have filed, the motions in the case, as well as oppositions, replies, and the judge's order. Now, some judges write really nice substantive orders. So those are gold, obviously, to right. understand the judge too. Not every judge does. It's a little dependent, but you can absolutely see what your opposing counsel has drafted previously. And you can see where they've been successful and where they haven't as well. Right. And how does it all like, I, I apologize for the simplistic question, but how does it all get into Trellis? Like all of this information, how does it feed into the system? Yeah, that's the hardest part. No okay. question is this for us is a county by county effort. There is no main source that we can go to get all of this data. It not only is it county by county, but even within counties, there is wild variation depending on the way the clerks input data in some cases. Okay. So what we get is think of it as raw fragmented data on a county by county basis that we have to do the work to structure. We have to do the work to say, this is this type of case. This is how long it takes. The judge, the parties, case type, for instance, seems obvious, but thousands of different counties across the nation, every one of them has, you know, says their case types in a totally different way. So okay. really mapping all of that back into one structured way to look at, say, a, a housing court and the, yep. the different, you know, types of cases there is what we have to do to create that and then map all the thousands of different ways that they're set in different courts back to our structure. Okay. Wow. That's, that's interesting. I can see how that's a big challenge, but how, how would you say that um, lawyers and non-lawyers are adopting to these tools that, you know, the, this, this amazing system that Trellis is providing? So I, you know, I, I think it's been an easier adoption process for a few reasons. One, we try to make our site as simple as Google. If you know how to search on Google, you're going to be able to search on our site as well. The other reason that we're having um, great uh, adoption is simply because we're able to get it into the lawyer's hands faster. Right. So, And the way that we do that is simply because, you know, Google has determined that our data is valuable. And when someone Googles a judge, they come to our data. When someone Googles a case or a particular motion, they come into wow. our data. And the lawyers then are able to see it for themselves, determine value, sign up for a free trial. So there's no risk to them. Sure. And then if, you know, if it is valuable, which that's the goal and they can decide, then they can become a, a paying user, but they get to fully dig into the data themselves to decide whether that's the case. Okay. Got it. Um, so is it more, is it more the lawyers or like non-lawyers looking at this? Or, I mean, I don't know. What would be the reason for a non-lawyer to have access? Yeah, it's interesting. We actually have a large consumer population. Okay. They're a little bit different than, we don't think of them as sort of our target customers. What they're doing on our site is they're often involved in litigation and they want maybe a particular document in their case and we're much easier to access and find than a court website is. Oh, interesting. So they'll yeah. come in, they'll get what they need, uh, but we don't really build our product for them. We build for the attorneys, but okay. it ends up being a good way to find documents. They also track cases. So we're a, a basically a tracking and alerting platform as well. Wow. So they're involved in the case. They can basically set an alert on that case and get notified if anything changes in their case as well. So is this built for, you said it's not built for the consumer, but is it built for like a plaintiff's lawyer? Or who, who would you say this is uh, like mostly geared towards? We actually cover both entirely and we have very large customer bases in, in either. The way I like to think about it is Lexus or Westlaw, you've got maybe a small plaintiff's firm and a large defense firm on every case each needs access to the underlying data. And yeah. so we're very much a research platform where both sides need access. They might use it a little bit differently. 
Um, one of the main use cases on the SMB side is often as a giant brief bank. You know, you're not limited to something you've written, but you have the entire right. trial court system to find something someone has written that's on point. Wow. So that's fun. right as you mentioned Westlaw and Lexis. That's like literally what I was writing down. You know, that's <laughs> like really what comes to mind is like yep. when you're searching cases and you're like shepherdizing and, and doing all that sort of thing, right? So this is this is actual like how people like handle cases and how, like looking at like what the like the trend of like what the judge is going to decide and yep. seeing how that opposing counsel uh, counselor is going to handle like a uh, you know write it like a brief or like where his position is yeah. going to be on on a certain issue. That's, That's exactly I, right. So, yeah. I like to think of it. So if you have you know we're used to searching on Lexis or Westlaw. And what you're searching there is court of appeals data. You're trying to find, you know, binding precedent. Right. So I like to think of Lexus or Westlaw as almost academic, sort of what should the court of appeals case law be that you want the judge to apply? Whereas Trellis is the practical. What is my judge actually applying right now? What do they think the, you know, threshold for this case is and understanding really on a practical level what's going in, going on in the trial court system? Wow, that's amazing. Um excuse me and you know this is like has it been a challenge to like track the i know we kind of talked about getting it all in the system but what about like tracking like new decisions how does that how is that affecting like your algorithm or your you know i'm sorry if i'm just trying yeah. to use these words here but yeah. <laughs> how, how, does, <laughs> how does that affect like the whole thing like when there's a new trial decision made it's it's constant. So if you think about what we do, when we go into a county, we grab uh, going back all historical data for at least 15 years. Usually it's to 2005, depending on when the court started digitizing. Okay. And then all the way forward. So new cases, but also all of the cases that exist that are changing and moving forward. So that is just a constant sort of ingestion machine where the new data is being uploaded and changed and new documents are filed and all of that on a daily basis. We have a couple ways. We have sort of our regular schedule with the courts where we uh, refresh our data. But then we also let users say, update this case right now. So if they want to be confident that, um, you know, maybe the judge decided something earlier that day and they want to know absolutely it's got everything, you can basically update your case in real time on our site as well, which means we move that docket to the very top of our queue. We go back to the court, we refresh it in real time so that users can always be entirely confident it's got um, whatever the, the, the court has recognized. <laughs> wow. So take me back again, just to like the moment, I usually ask people the moment that they want to become a lawyer. But for you, I want to know, like, you know, you went to court and you're, you just saw this thing that's saying like, just can you tell me, take me a little bit through like the mind frame again, I want to continue this discussion. But I, I just kind of, it's just so interesting that you found this like huge gap that needed to yep. be filled. So the real origin sort of light bulb moment for me was when I was writing a summary judgment motion and I was up late and I was complaining to one of my colleagues that was in the office. This is back when we were all in the office and I wasn't sure how to structure the motion. It was a complicated issue. I didn't know anything about the judge. And really, I was just kind of complaining and venting. Yeah. And my colleague told me that he actually thought he had appeared before the same judge a few years earlier. Mm. And he, we went back and in the file, which I never would have known about, never would have been able to find, there was a PDF in there that was a ruling by my judge on the exact issue on a summary judgment motion. And it was like I got the answers to the test. So I could see wow. exactly the way the judge thought about it. And I could see the case law. And so I knew how to structure the motion. And basically I wrote, I ended up writing it in a quarter of the time. I won. And for me, that was where I stepped back and said, you know, how is it possible that I didn't have this as a resource to start? But right. there is this data out there, but somehow lawyers aren't able to access it right now. And why is that? And, and what can we do about it? And so that was really light bulb moment for me. In California specifically, which is where I was practicing at that point, there are things released called tentative rulings. They're specific to California, a couple other states, but it's basically before a judge rules on the record, they, the day before, release their decision. And it's 
it's why, why they're going to grant or deny your motion. And then they don't usually change from that. That almost 100% of the time becomes the ruling of the court. But if you go in for oral argument, you can focus on a couple things the judges said, um, even though you know what they're likely to decide because they've told you. That is where we started. So we started with aggregating these tentative rulings. And then we started grabbing data from the courts that I was appearing in. Really, I wow. built it in the beginning. Um, with the only engineer that I knew at the time and said, look, there's data being released and it's not being aggregated right now. And I wanted in my own practice. And so right. we started grabbing data from the courts that I was appearing in most often, okay. uh, which was up and down California at that point. And for two years, I actually utilized that data sort of as my own secret weapon. And I went on during that two years to win every single motion that I wow. had. And so for me, it took away the the fear of what if this isn't valuable? I knew it was valuable. And so it gave me the courage then to say, this is a huge opportunity. Um, and, you know, founder delusion, I think I'm the one that's going to be able to do it. <laughs> that's, yeah, so, that's... There you go. That's how you end up with a business. How did you sift through it all at the beginning? Like when you were collecting it, like what was that process like? So all automated, only pulling records that are digital at this point. And so yeah. you're taking on a, you know, think of the case docket as the home base for everything. So all yeah. the motions that are filed belong to a case, all the metadata for the case, the parties, the judge. And then if you classify each of those things out, it means you can search by that and open okay. up the sort of universe of other information. Okay. Um, so what, what do you have uh, in terms of employees now? Like what's like the biggest roles at Trellis? Like what are people doing to get everything together? What what kind of a staff do you have? We have definitely a harvest team, uh, yep. but product and engineering. We are a technology yep. company at the end yep. of the day. Um, so we are uh, highly technical uh, staff. We do have a content team because we create a lot of content as well. Um, such as we, for every state, we go through the most common motions, most common legal issues. Mm -hmm. And we basically think of it as a treatise. But what we do there is actually map to the practical cases that are dealing with that particular issue right now. So a lot of content creation as well. Um, mm -hmm. We create all of our judge biographies in-house. That's our team. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, sales team that uh, deals primarily with our larger enterprises. And we are close to 60 folks at this point. Wow, that's unbelievable. Are they uh, are they scattered around or on most California? Yeah. Yeah, we're actually international as well. Wow. Congratulations. We started, thank you. We started in California. Um, so we have a good 30% or so of our employees that are Southern California local. But yep. really, everyone we've hired since COVID has been entirely distributed. So wow. we have our team is all over. That's amazing. Um, where where'd the name come from, by the way? Trellis, is that like, is there a story so, in that? I'm honestly, I'm a gardener at heart. And nice. it was the idea of sort of growth and support for your practice that this data could help grow and support your practice. And I just like growing things. And so yeah. it was right. one of those. That's awesome. Um, so how do, <clears throat> excuse me, how does Trellis make law firms more valuable to their clients? Um, you know, are we replacing lawyers here or like, is that what we're going to see in 20 years or what do you, what do we think? You know, it's an interesting question. I can't <laughs> speak to what is going to happen necessarily. I can tell you my thoughts, but particularly for litigation, I just don't see anything anywhere near term where you're going to be able to replace litigators. So what we are is just another tool. It, we are a tool in the arsenal of litigators wow. to be the best advocate for their clients. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it's incredible. I feel like I have so many questions just like coming to my mind about it. So jurors too, I think I read about, is there something that uh, Trellis does with jurors or how does that work? We, we aggregate and collect verdict data as well. Okay. So if you think about it, um, when you've probably ever seen verdict information up till now, certainly at the state trial court level, you've seen maybe a blurb and the amount of the verdict. What we do is we take that information and map it to the underlying case. So when you're looking at verdict information, 
you're in basically the docket of the case, but enhanced with a lot of information. What was the makeup of the jury? Was there an original demand? What was the uh, ultimate outcome? Did it get reduced <laughs> later on? Um, and the ability for someone to then actually look and see, look at the documents of the case, look at the jury instructions, look at the verdict form. What did the jury understand? What didn't they understand? But really understand when we're making comparisons about cases and we're saying, what is this case worth? Well, being able to have a little context into the actual case rather than a sort of one to two sentence, and you don't really know what was going on in the case. So we do a lot of work to extract out verdict information okay, uh, and then map it visible onto the uh, case information itself, where then you can actually search the analytics for it. So you can say car crash in, you know, New York, where the ankle was injured. And then you can see sort of the range of highest, lowest, median, um, that sort of thing. Wow. Um, so what, give, yeah, give us an example of a search. Like say you're, you're gonna, um, you know, say you're like an injury attorney and, uh, yep. you know, you, you're going in for like a motion. I don't know, just give us some sort of a, an, an example. So my favorite is mixing and matching different things. So if you know the judge you're in front of, then you go to that judge and whatever you're searching, you're searching four buckets of data on our site. Uh, think of it as it looks similar to a Google search, but you're searching four but different buckets of data. Right. One is gonna be rulings, rulings that match your search terms. If it's a judge, rulings by that judge. Uh, cases, all of their historical cases, uh, basically on a docket page. The dockets are very similar to what you find on a county court website. All, everything that's there will be on our site, except enhanced with a lot of additional information. Documents, filed documents where you're searching the body and text of those documents, and then separate verdicts tab where you can look at some of the analytics that we talked about. So if I was a personal injury attorney, I might um, look up my judge and a particular motion and a specific practice area. Um, now, maybe I want to add in my opposing counsel and see if my opposing counsel has appeared before my judge on that issue before. Or maybe they were involved with an accident with Uber and I want to search Uber and, you know, wrongful death in uh, Suffolk County, you know, and then add a few facts that are relevant to my case. And so what you're doing is the way you search on Google, you're putting in search for what you're hoping to find. And then surfaces information. And then from there, you say, actually, here, there was a pedestrian that came in, and then I can add that to my search. So you can search the within the search, like it starts off broad, and then you can narrow it down. Correct. Okay. All right, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So keep No, know. absolutely. So that that would be an example there. Um, a lot of motion drafting goes uh, narrow to start by document title that I want. It's a summary judgment motion. And the issue is breach of contract and uh, there is insurance coverage issues, and it's in this county. And so that's how you narrow down. You're mixing and matching these different aspects to get into the most relevant data. But you can start as broad as you want, and you can narrow um, as narrow as you want. Wow, okay. Um, so out of all the cases and all the info, like what percentage do you think is like of everything out there is like into, or is it really hard to tell? Like. How much is it on trellis right now yeah. or exists in the world? <laughs> no, like on trellis. Yeah. So we currently cover for every county that we cover. I mentioned we go back at least 15 years historical docket data. So we don't discriminate when we bring in a county. We bring in all the data for that county, regardless of case type. Um, and so we currently are around 2000 counties that we cover wow. and 42 states. Okay. And the goal is we'll be 44 states by the end of this year and really to bring in that total 50 by Q1 of next year. So we're working hard. We have grown dramatically. Um, remember, for us, it's a county by county effort. So yep. those thousands of counties just continuing to go after and, and bring in the, the others as well. We try and get about 90 percent of a state's population covered before we release that state. Gotcha. OK, that makes sense. Um, so are you seeing trends like in the marketplace, like with, like, you know, and how is trellis like adopting to them? Yeah. Um, I think that, that lawyers at this point want things to be easier. It, it's almost yeah. like there is too much information and how do they distill out what actually matters? And 
I think that's where we do a great job. It's not something that's hidden behind a paywall that you can't figure out. You can go in, search yourself, say, yeah, I think this will save me time and give me strategic information or no, you know what? It's not the right fit for me and, and something else is. And so we're able to um, really have our users come to us, which has been the, uh, you know, what, which has led really to our growth as it is. Right. Um, that being said, we're growing with large enterprise A100s as well. Uh, it's just a very different sales process. Yeah, no, I mean, just it, it does sort of make it would once you learn how to probably use Trellis in the system, like I would imagine it makes uh, an attorney's job like much easier. I mean, is that that's probably the goal, right? I mean, but yes, that but is it, certainly the goal. Yeah, I mean, just looking up, uh, you know, I mean, finding my, I mean, you're look, now looking at the mindsets of of opposing counsel and like sure. uh, the judge and. Yep. juries and for, I mean it's just yeah. unbelievable to think back to like being in the stacks with the books you know what I'm saying like to having like all these things now um yes, yes. So and just goal is to continue making that even yeah. more simple I mean AI is doing you know there's such incredible stuff that you can do and that we're working on right now and we're lucky to have this data set we have this incredible data set that while it's public, it's just so hard to acquire and structure and be able to make meaning out of. And so we're in a really unique position here to have this incredible data, as well as the technology that we've all seen that is doing some really incredible stuff now. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so where do you see this industry in like the next five years and like past that? I think there's going to be some massive changes. I, I really do. Um, I, I don't think we're not having robot lawyers. I, I'm not there. I'll argue it with anybody. Um, I, I still think it is humans at the end of the day. Now where there might be some large changes is it might be, um, and it will be. I think the technology will make some of the work that we do uh, just less time consuming. It still takes a legal mind at the end of the day to put it all together, to, to you know, check, to um, make the right decisions with the data. But it's very possible. I think I think contract uh, sort of transactional attorneys, they're in trouble. I, I think really? that AI is coming for those jobs. For tell, me, sure. tell me how so. Be more. I'm curious because I mean, I could think it through and but I, I'm curious what your opinion is on that. So there's stuff that uh, generative AI can do really well, and there's stuff that it, we definitely it's there's it's still working on, and it needs more time to develop before it's yep. ready for prime time for lawyers. Um, putting together contract clauses is something that is a pattern that is very easy for AI, even in its current state, to do. It's why you're going to see a lot of legal technology companies that are focusing on contract management, contract drafting, all of those things, because that's where it's a smaller subset of what needs to be done. Are there different contracts for everything? Yes. But are there some core ones that you're going to see over right. and over again? And then, so being able to train that data set with the way your company wants to see it or the way you as a law firm want to create that, um, that's possible. And I think that that will definitely change that industry more. Um, I think that it will bleed into litigation as well. I think, and they, we're not right, we're not there yet, but the technology is continuing to improve. And will there potentially be uh, less overhead necessary at law firms, less support staff, maybe less associates? Yes, I do think eventually that is what we'll be moving towards. I think it'll require some changes in billing. And I'm not worried about law firms. <laughs> They're going to figure out how to value yeah. based bill and, right. and, and still do fine. Um, but I think that some areas of law are, are easier to automate than others. It's crazy because I have this thought of, of like having an Alexa for like, I don't even have an Alexa, but yeah, like yeah. just for like law firms, you know, you, you just say something into Alexa and she like spits out the, the answer, the sites, the citation, the judge's rule, the, you know, the exactly. reasoning, and then you're just like, okay, I'm going to court, um, you Thank know, you. Or, 
or the I'll brief. just say that. Stay tuned for yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will because we're going to stay in touch. I'm very interested um, to see where okay. this goes. But just uh, Nicole, a couple items, just a couple questions I wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for female attorneys uh, who want to be involved in legal tech and science? Honestly, you got to just go for it. So when I was practicing, um, I switched firms a variety of times. I kept thinking it was the firm that's the problem. And turns out it's just a really difficult uh, industry, particularly as women. You don't see a lot of people, a lot of equity partners that look like you. Um, oftentimes, if they are there, they don't have families. And so you basically... Um, you're just you're not able to see patterns of where you can see yourself really going um, and in, in improving your life and having a big return. And for me, before starting the company, I felt like I had blinders on, like, you know how horses have their sort of blinders and it keeps them focused. Yeah. It felt like that was me. And I thought that my only option if I wasn't happy was to change law firms. And now that I'm in legal tech, it's just, there's there's a universe of potential out there. Legal tech in particular is getting a lot of attention from VCs for the first time really ever. There's a lot of new companies starting. There's a lot of companies that are continuing to grow. And just be open to the fact that all of these opportunities exist. You just have to go look for them. And there are so many things you can do with a legal background. We love hiring lawyers. I think of them as our recovering lawyers. And they're phenomenal at all different aspects of the business from, right. you know, success to sales, to helping with our MR machine learning classifications. I mean, there's so many jobs here where having a legal background is something that we look for. And we're not the only company. There, there's many of them. So there is right. a universe of potential out there. Yeah, that's uh, that's good to know. You know, you could do anything with a law degree, right? So having jobs, yeah. and startups. I didn't and believe that before, but it turns out yeah. it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, one one other quick question. So I saw smart search technology. Is that related to you guys at all? Like the that the, is that's our our search is smart search. Smart search because you have mm -hmm. the trademark and everything. So I was yep. just I wanted to, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Um, sure. So any other advice or anything else you'd like to share out there with uh, lawyer stories that we might have missed today? Oh, let's see. That's a that's a broad one. Um, it is very broad, yes. I think, I, I do think we are at a really exciting inflection point for legal right now. And I think whether you move into a technology space or not, lawyers that are practicing are going to be on the benefiting end of a lot of really cool technology. Now, it doesn't mean it's right for you and your practice, but like get out there and try stuff and um, keep an open mind because I think there's a lot of technology that's brewing right now that's really exciting. That's all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, to learn more about Trellis, you can go to www.trellis.law. Um, and very, very interesting. I know I'm going to keep an eye on it and hopefully we'll stay in touch. And I really appreciate your your time and, and uh, congrats on all your su success once again. Thanks, Benny. And uh, go UMass. So just uh, <laughs> stay there for one minute. Everybody else, thanks for tuning in, uh, wherever you are in the world today. Enjoy yourselves. Cheers. <laughs>